All right, we are in on page 27 of the notes, and um, we're right at letter F there, talking about um, our relationship in Christ. In verses 21 through 33, is talking about the husband and wife relationship, and um, a lot of great information we can all apply in our marriages to submit to one another, to love, uh, to to um, to nurture our relationship and to grow it. Uh, and, and just to have a, a relationship of unity, uh, being one in the Lord. And then it ends at verse number 32 and 33. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. And so we see here that he, he says, listen, I, I want to tell you a secret. I've really been talking about our relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, we're the bride of Christ. We as the church uh, need to be in unity with him and uh, to know him as Paul talked about in Philippians and uh, just really to apply these principles in our, in our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and in our relationship as a couple as well. It's important for us to remember as Christians that our marriage relationship is a, um, a very important picture of our relationship with Christ and a testimony to the world around us. And uh, when that's broken, it, it hurts uh, that, that testimony for the Lord. But also, um, so our, our marriage is, is important to the stability and the, and the sanctity of, of our testimony as well. And the world really needs to see Christ in our marriage. And then um, as we review these notes, how do these principles apply to our relationship with Christ? And so if you look back at the beginning of this section, letter A, what does it mean to uh, to pray always, uh, I'm sorry, that's the next section there. But we talked about, I don't have that notes right here in front of me, but we talked about submitting one to another. We talked about loving, especially the sacrificial servant love. We talked about uh, having a pure set apart relationship uh, and to nurture it and to grow it in unity. And so he's saying, this is not just about the marriage relationship, but it's about the relationship with the Lord. So how do we apply these same principles to our relationship with the Lord. Anybody have a comment on that before we move on to the next section? How do we apply these same principles to our relationship with the Lord? Diane? Okay, cleaving to your spouse, we should be cleaved to the Lord. Okay, and the word cleave means to be glued, to be bonded, uh, and, and we bond through pressure. And we bond through uh, we, the things that sometimes are, are the hardest in our relationship. And we can bond with the Lord in that same way. Anybody else? Tubu? Christ is the As Christ is the bridegroom, we're the bride, we have that relationship. And you use the term worship, which I think is a good term, but sometimes we think of worship, you know, uh, I, I don't want my wife to bow down and worship me. You know. But at the same time, if you remember what, what Peter said in, in, in First Peter, talking about Abraham and Sarah, where she called him Lord, and she that the respect that she had and that, that, that uh, submission uh, to him as well is important in that relationship also. Okay? Anybody else? Peter? More like uh, the wives are to submit to husbands. We as, as church members are to submit to our Lord. We're to submit to the Lord and understanding that submission in, in the same way we do we should with the husband. Too often submission is is looked at at, at the idea of uh, somehow we've got to just do what you're told to do and just obey and and like, you know, that, that kind of attitude, which is not what the Lord wants from us. He wants us a, a, a relationship where we submit to him in love and respect. Okay? Anybody else before we move on? So just kind of finishing up that last section there. And so we're going into chapter 6. And again, as we pointed out here, we, we start out talking about the, the church as a whole and how we're to be united as a church and we're to come together as a body in Christ and then he talks about our relationship with the Holy Spirit and being filled with the Spirit. And then immediately right there, he talks about the marriage relationship. And then next, he talks about the parent and children relationship. And uh, chapter 6 and verses 1 and 2 and even verse 3 are, are probably 
the first verses that we want our children to memorize. Uh, I think every parent at some point is, is quoted this enough that our children know it by heart, or um, we've even said, you need to memorize these verses. And we really, as parents, need to memorize it, including with verse number four. And so he's talking about the children and the parent relationship. And I put in the notes there to walk in obedience, not in dishonor. To walk in obedience and not dishonor. And he talks not only about the children and the parents, but then he goes on to talk about the servants and masters as well. And, and so we start out with children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And, and the word obey, um, we, we, we sit, saw this word earlier in our study as well, uh, and the difference between obey and submit from that, that aspect. But what does the word obey here mean? What's the primary uh, definition or understanding of the word obey here? Anybody know? It's a little bit different than what we looked at before. The word obey. What do you what do you think? When it says children obey your parents to the Lord, what do you think that, that is, is saying there? Following their instructions. Following their instructions. Okay, good. Okay. Diane? I have a cross reference to another verse that says, Hearken unto thy fathers that be happy. Okay, what's the reference for that verse? Proverbs 23, 23, to hearken unto your, what's the verse say again? Hearken unto. Hearken unto thy father that begat thee and despise not thy mother, which is old. Okay. Listen to them. Yeah, it, it literally means to listen or to hear, to listen or to hear. And so the primary responsibility of the child is to pay attention, which, which is something that as children, we struggled with. I, I know I did, and, and I, if your, your children as well probably struggle with the same thing, is one of the things we want for our kids is, okay, when I'm talking to you, listen to me. And, and so the, you know, part of honoring and obeying your parents is to, to listen to what they say uh, with open ears and open mind and open heart uh, to hear what's being said. And so often that, that doesn't happen, and so it's, it's to listen or to hear. Go back to 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse number 9. 1 Samuel chapter 3. You remember Samuel, uh, was, was, uh, his mother had taken him to the temple to, to be there uh, because she had dedicated him to the Lord. He was there serving at the temple. And in verse number 9, it says, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, remember Samuel had heard the Lord calling to him, Samuel, Samuel, and he thought it was Eli, and ran to Eli and said, Yes, sir, what do you want? And Eli said, I didn't call you. And he goes back again and again. And finally, Eli realizes that this is God talking to Samuel. And in verse number 9, he says, Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. And so Samuel went and laid down in his place. And so one of the important parts of obeying is to listen and to hear what's being said. And uh, young people, I want, I want to remind you of that. You know, obeying also includes doing what you're told, but as you grow older, that's less important than listening and understanding and, and giving weight to that. You know, when you, when you listen to somebody, it's because you believe they have something to say to you. Um, you, you believe that there's something you can learn from them. And so when you, with your parents, you need to realize that they have something to say, they have something I can learn, and I need to listen to their wisdom. I need to listen to their instruction. I need to listen to what they want me to do. And, and, and so as, as a younger child, you just need to do what you're told to do. As you get older, it's, it's more responsibly to listen and understand and, and to respond back as well. Right. And whenever you see the phrase in the Lord, you'll see that in this passage, you'll see that a lot of times with husbands and wives, a wife is to submit in the Lord or to, you know, obey in the Lord. When you see that phrase, it's not just, you know, in, in Acts chapter five, the Bible talked about, you know, how that we ought to obey God rather than men. And so there, there clearly is, we, we have a responsibility if we're told to do something that violates what God wants us to do or what God tells us to do, then we clearly have a responsibility to not do, do that. 
And, but we also take that responsibility very, very strongly. Um, it's like in the military, you're not supposed to obey a, an unlawful order. And um, so if, some, if somebody gives you an order, shoot that guy who's the prisoner, and you know, that's an unlawful order, then you have a responsibility to say, no, I'm not gonna do that. But with that, no comes a, a great, um, you have to be willing to take the consequences. If you're in the military and you refuse an order, you're going to stand before a body and be, be said, you know, you need to do this. You know, why did you not do that order? And you're going to be put on trial for that. And so we have to realize that if I, as a, um, it's through the authority above me, choose not to listen or not to obey, because I think that's not what God would have me do, I'm going to answer to God for me for that. And I think you go back to Daniel as well. What Daniel was told, told was not necessarily, I mean, he was told to eat unclean things, which God has said to eat clean things. And, but he didn't just refuse that order. He did it, I believe, in the Lord by going to that authority um, with respect and honor. I've listened to you. I'd like you to listen to me as well. And you know what? Your authority is always going to be better, more willing to listen to you when they know they've been hurt. A lot of times parents don't want to listen to a child because the child never listens to them. And, uh, and, and so they just... You, you shut me out, I'm going to shut you out. Just do what you're told to do. But if a, if a young person says, no, my parents are given to me by God, and, and that's where the in the Lord comes in, is sometimes I can't trust the authority, but I can trust God. And, and so that's what we have to come down to, whether it's a wife submitting to her husband, or whether it's a parent submitting to their, a child submitting to their parents, or whether it's submitting to a, a, an authority in other cases, is, is in the Lord is that, uh, I'm going to trust God, even though I can't necessarily trust this person. I know as a husband, I've not always been trustworthy. Uh, I've not always been, you know, I've made decisions that I haven't thought through or whatever else it might be. And, and so my wife has had to submit in the Lord and trusting that, okay, if I do the right thing here, God's going to take care of the rest of it and uh, make that happen. So that's more what the end of it says, children obey your parents in the Lord, Ephesians chapter six. That's the idea of it. And for a child, it's a much greater responsibility because they don't know to say, no, I don't think God wants me to do that. Uh, you have to take that with a heavy responsibility, with a respect like Daniel, with a submission, submissive attitude. All those things have to come into play with that, uh, in that aspect. But if I can encourage the children is, is, is to understand this passage, how it applies, is, and again, especially as you gain age, when you're just two or three years old, you know, just do what I told you to do. And why should you do that? Because I'm bigger than you. you know, that's, that's what it comes down to. And, uh, but as a child gets older, then he has more of a responsibility to listen and to understand and, and to communicate both ways on that as well. And for us as parents, it, you know, we want to just tell our kids, even as teenagers and young, young people, just do what I told you to do. And, and, but we don't give them an opportunity to listen to, and to understand. We, we don't explain ourselves or we don't try to have that dialogue. And, and yes, there's times that, you know, it just comes down to, you just need to do what you're told to do, even if you don't understand it. But I think as a child grows older, one of the failures that we have so often, and what I've seen in my own family and I've seen in other families, is as they get in those teen years, we, we haven't taught them. And the best time to teach them is in that transition period. Get them to start when they're young and just obey, just do what I told you to do. And if you can get them to start doing that at zero to about five or six years of age where they obey, but then you have to transition somewhere in those early years into, uh, yes, you need to obey me, but here's why. And helping them to understand and to hear, teaching them how to hear. A lot of children have never been taught how to listen. And, and you listen with your eyes. You look at them. You listen with, without distraction. You listen by responding back and having a dialogue. It's not just a one-way street. So we haven't taught it to our children. So when they become teenagers, they don't know how to do that. And, then, and so they don't listen. And that's when a lot of parents really get, you know, you, you're supposed to obey me because I'm your parents. And they, but they haven't taught them how to listen to them. And so it is a process of listening uh, and dialogue that has to happen there. And, and so we as parents need to train that into them around seven years old or so, somewhere in that range. They should have already learned to obey, and now we can teach. 
and, and it, it, it begins before seven, but it more and more comes in. So that by the time they're in those junior high years and they're becoming that teenager, they've learned how to have, have a dialogue. They have learned to listen and to understand and, 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 and there's still an expectation of obedience. You're gonna obey because you're living in my house. You're eating my food. You're, you're living, you know, you got a bed because I gave it to you. There's a certain aspect that's always gonna be there, but we have to transition them out into where they become young adults. They still wanna come and ask your advice. They still believe that there's wisdom that they can gain from you as well. And so in order for them to listen to hear, we've gotta have the dialogue. And ultimately, you're going to do what you need to be told. That's what God says to children. Ultimately, it is to obey, but it starts by listening and hearing. And then letter A there, the question that you asked is, what does it mean, the phrase in the Lord? Go over to Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17. Hebrews 13, 17, the Bible says, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. Remember, there's two different things there. Obey is I'm gonna do what you told me to do. Submit is the attitude I do it with. It's to do it with the right attitude. So obey and submit uh, yourselves for they watch for your souls that they must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. To understand that, that when you obey and submit, then it's benefiting you. It's in the Lord. And, and it's trusting in God. And again, sometimes you don't understand. Sometimes it may be unreasonable. It, it may not be the right thing that you're being asked to do, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. Uh, it is understanding that I need to still show the honor and respect, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. That's what Daniel did. And so in the Lord is just meaning that we trust God, even if we can't trust the authority that's above us, whoever that authority is. And um, we trust God to take care of us through that situation. Because it's not a blind. There was a guy that taught for a while. You know, if your husband tells you to rob a bank, go do it and trust God. You know, no, there's a point where you guys say, you know what? God says that's wrong. And I'm not going to do that. Uh, you know, so there, there is a, a point where we have to obey God rather than men. But we need to do that carefully. We need to do that respectfully. We need to understand one day I'm going to stand before God. God's going to look at me and say, why did you not obey why did you do what you did? And we're going to have to give a, an answer that is in the Lord in that process of that as well. And so we need to understand that. But it, all, it also is trusting God in, in the situation. Some of, some of you may be like, I, I, had, I did not have a good dad. And um, you may not have a parent that's, that's the right, you know, does all the right things. But you're trusting God. God knew what he was doing when he put it on that parent. And you're going to trust the Lord in that. And so even when you say, well, my parents don't understand or they don't know this or they don't know that, you're trusting in God to, to work it out. If you're going to obey and do the right thing, God's going to work it out and, and working that. So why should children obey is, again, we teach them first to obey for their, their safety, for their protection. As parents, it's our responsibility to teach them how to obey. And that's critical at this young age, what we teach them to do that. So they obey. And then, but the, the problem I see a lot of parents is not transitioned in those middle years. And so when they become a teenager and they start becoming independent and they start thinking for themselves and they start questioning everything, you haven't taught them how to obey or listen and understand. And so that's important for us to do in that process as well. Does that make sense? Any other thoughts or questions on that? So... And you know, this is right, and if for you young people in the room, the right thing to do is the right thing to do, and we should do what's right. Okay, look at number two there. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Okay, what does it mean to honor someone or something? What does that, that word mean to honor uh, someone or something? Anybody have a thought on that? What does it mean to honor? Okay, respect. I, I do think honor and respect are two different terms. Um, remember, respect is the idea of to respect the position. I do think it's involved here. Inward, inward respect. Inward respect. Okay. All right. So let me let me just explain the word respect real quick uh, from my perspective. When we use the word respect, it's like those of you in the military understand. You respect the the Bible talks about those elders that rule well give them double honor. You respect the person and you respect the position. 
So respect is respecting position. This is my parents. You know, I've often said this, don't treat your parents like you would not want somebody else to treat them. Don't treat your spouse like you would not allow. And no husband should talk to his spouse in a way that he would hit, a, hit another man if he talked to his spouse that way. No young person should treat his parents in a way that he would not want somebody else to treat them. And, and so respect is the way we, we respect the position, whether they're being good or not, whether they're doing what you want or not, whatever it is, you respect the position. When the military, when I saluted an officer, uh, I, I looked at some officers, at the, I looked at their shoulder, and other ones I looked them in the eyes. Uh, for the person that was the officer, and they weren't especially the best person I ever knew, uh, they weren't a good person, I, I respected their position. I looked them at the shoulder. But the ones that were officers and gentlemen or gentlewomen, they were good people, I looked them in the eyes and I gave them double honor. I respected their position and their person. And parents aren't always respectable. Uh, I know that for myself. Uh, we don't always do the right things, but we sought to respect their position as well as to respect the person. Okay, answer? Okay, honoring their position that they're the mom and dad and they have that authority, but God-given authority. And that goes back to in the Lord. And so we respect that position. Glenda? To revere them or show reverence for them. Okay, to revere or reverence them. Uh, when you talk about the word revere or reverence, how would that look for a, a young person or a child? Okay. And, and trust. Okay. All right. Okay. Anybody else? Like, David? To praise. Huh? To praise. Praise. Okay. Diane? Going with what she said, you, know, you may not agree, you may not like it, you may not understand it, but because you're my parents, I'll submit to you. Okay. All right. Again, going back to the position as well. Okay, let's look at, um, in, in the notes there, the word I put in the blank there, to honor means to value something, to value something. Uh, we see an example of that over in uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. If you want to take a look at that, and then we'll look at Proverbs in just a moment, but we're over here right now. Um, so going over to 1 Peter chapter 3 is talking about the husband and wife relationship in verse seven, it says, likewise, you husbands dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, as being heirs together, the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And the, the honor here is the same word. And the weak, weaker vessel doesn't mean that she's not as strong as you are. There's a lot of women I know are a lot stronger than most men. You know, it's not as strong, as strong as you are. The weaker vessel is like describing a, a very delicate vase or something of great value. When you have something of value, you know, if you go down and buy a vase from the dollar store, you're not going to worry about how you treat it. Uh, you're not going to worry if the kids grab it and start playing with it. But if you've got a vase that's the, from the Ming Dynasty of China, it's worth thousands of dollars, you would definitely treat it differently, wouldn't you? Because it has great value. And when you value something, you treat it differently. And so to honor your parents is to value them. Go over to Proverbs chapter 1 and look at verses 8 and 9. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It says, my son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Uh, talking about just something, you know, you wear, you wear a necklace because uh, uh, it, it makes you look good and, and it has value to it too. I bought my wife for our 25th anniversary, I bought a uh, pearl necklace and that was the most expensive thing I probably bought up to that point, especially, and, and so it had great value. And so it's valuable, but it's not just the monetary value, it's sentimental value. It's the value of who gave it to you. I, I think she values that necklace more because I gave it to her on our 25th anniversary. All of those things come in play. And so if a, if a young person is supposed to honor or value his parents, why would he value his parents? Give me some reasons why a young person say, yeah, you have value to me. Why would a young person value his parents? There's some obvious things to start out with and then some not so obvious. So give me some reasons why, you know, think about why you would value anything. So what are some reasons that you would, that a young person should honor or value his parents? Okay, out of love, we value something that we love. And uh, so out of love for them, 
But do young people always feel love towards their parents? Teenagers? Do you guys always feel love towards your parents? Probably not. Same thing with a husband and wife. I don't always feel love towards my wife. So if that's the only reason I'm going to value them is if and when I love them, that's not going to be much value, is it? It's not going to be much of the process. But that is part of the reason. You ought to love your parents. And the, the fact that they love you gives them value. Because, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, your parents probably wouldn't love you if they didn't have, if you, they didn't have to. <laughs> You're their kid. I got to love you. I'm required to do that. Where a lot of people wouldn't love you when you act the way you do, but your parents will still love you even though the way you act, they still love you. And so that gives them value. Okay? Why else would we honor, uh, would a young person honor? Noel? They're given by God. Yeah, again, who gave it to you? When it's given you by God, this is, this is God gave me my mom. God gave me my dad. And, and you say, well, they're not perfect. That doesn't matter. It still came from God. And they have value. If you ever watched like the Antique Roadshow, there's some things that have value, not because they're made of gold and really expensive from that point of view. It's their provenance. It's where they came from. This was given to me, my grandmother, my great-great-grandmother by Abraham Lincoln. Boy, that gives it value because it came from Abraham Lincoln. It, it may be something that's a piece of junk, but it has value because of who gave it. And, and, and so that creates value. And so when a young person realizes these you know, are the parents God gave me, God put me in that womb with that DNA with those parents for a reason. And so they have value for that purpose. And so that changes how my attitude is towards them. Okay. Why else would a young person honor? Larry? For me, uh, the first time I called my mom in uh, around June 2012, I called her back. That's the first time I called her back. I love her. Thank you for being there with me. Thank you for everything you have. Thank you for what? Bringing you to the world. They're the ones that brought you to the world. And so just say, you know, Larry said in 2012, he called his mom and said, you know what? You brought me in this world. There's some value to that because I'm, I have value and you brought me here. So there's some value to that. Okay. All right. Answer. They provide for you. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't uh, shoot the one who's bringing you food and, and taking care of you and giving you a house and all the rest of those things. You know, they're, they're the person that's providing for you. And a lot of young people just don't appreciate all their parents do for them, all that they provide for them. And so it's taking time to realize they, they give me a lot and uh, they provide for me. Okay. Time. It's something that has value because of time invested. Okay. Any other thoughts? Experience may have or have not, but has it. Yeah, the experience they have and the wisdom they can bring in, there's value to your parents. They have lived a life. And, uh, and they, can, they can help you from the things they did right and the things they did wrong as well. And so they, they provide that value in that way. And so to honor something is to value it. Now, letter A there, how many times is this promise repeated in the Bible uh, is, is, is this promise of going back to Ephesians chapter 6. It says, honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment, with promise. And the promise is that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long in the earth. Nine times in the Bible that's repeated, that, that promise. And when God says something nine times, that's a promise you can bank on. And so why, what is the, how would the promise come true? So here I am, I'm a teenager, I'm a young person. If I obey my parents, that means listening, understanding, Having a dialogue log with, not just, okay, you told me to do this, do that, I'm going to do it. You know, it's a dialogue. It's learning from them, okay? I'm a young person that's obeying my parents and honoring them. What is the promise going to give me? What, what can I expect later on then? It means, it means if I obey and honor my parents, it says that it may be well with thee. So what does that mean? And that thou mayest live long in the earth. Does that mean I can, I can guarantee I'm going to live to 100 if I obey and honor my parents? And the kids that don't, they're going to die early. Is that what it means? We'd all be dead. <laughs> We'd all be dead. <laughs> I know I would. <laughs> I'd have been dead a long time ago. Okay, so what, what does it mean to live well and, and long? What, what, is the, what is the promise that we're given there? What do you think? How do you think that? 
How do you think we can apply it? You know, because we, we as humans, and I think especially teenagers are guilty of this because it's just a lot of things happening in their life. We don't look at the long term. A lot of teenagers will do things and they don't think about how this is going to affect them. You know, I've talked about many times it's a 20 year backward look. How's it going to affect them when they grow up later on? And, and so I think, that's, I, I think that's really what it's coming down to is, is your understanding that they can help me to avoid the consequences of life. Because if I listen to them, I'm not going to have to suffer the consequences of that. Remember in Psalms chapter 25, it talks about the sins of the youth. And the sins of the youth are not just young people do this and old people don't. Because a lot of things teenagers struggle with, I know 40 years will struggle with it. Okay? So it's not just that. It's when we do something as a teenager, as a young person, we live with the consequences of that for the rest of our life. And you know, those of us who are older know we can look back and things that we did 40 years ago or 50 years ago, we're still suffering the consequences of now. And if we look back and we just say, if I just done differently, and that's really what we what need to learn is that I can learn from that. If I've got good parents, I can learn from they did the right thing, or they can tell me this is what I did wrong and I don't want you to follow my steps. You know, it's it's like like the dad, the kid who came home with a bad report card and and uh, he went up to the attic and got his dad's report card from the same age out of a box up there and brought it down and said, here's my report card, dad, and here's one of yours. And, and his dad said, well, I'm going to give you exactly what my dad gave me when I brought that report card home. You know, he, I don't want you to mess up like I did. And so sometimes it's the wisdom of experience in a bad sense, not just in a good sense. But I, I can learn from my parents. But not all parents are good parents either. And so I can learn from their mistakes too. I, I learned from my dad. Uh, an alcoholic, abusive man. I learned a lot from him. And I'm thankful for the lessons I learned the hard way because I'm not who he was. And I've not followed those steps. And, and I think that that is part of what God taught me. Even though I didn't understand these principles completely, I was able to learn from him. And I'm able to live a lot better life, a, a, a lot a, a more well life and a longer life. He died a lot younger than I was than he did because of that reason, because I learned from his mistakes. He wouldn't tell me, hey, son, don't drink. He never told me that, you know, but I learned not to do that. And so it's a learning process in that, in that way as well. Okay. Okay. We should honor our parents more than our peers. Go to John chapter five and verse number 44. John chapter five and verse number 44. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that come from God only? And, you know, for just, you know, not to be too repetitious, a lot of you have heard this before, but I've talked about the thumb and opposition. But, you know, we have the, the opposition it allows us to get a grip on life. And if our young people can learn that opposition is going to help me to get a grip on life, they're the thumb and you got the opposition. And I talk about having a pointer in your life, somebody who's not, that's willing to tell you the truth even when you don't want to hear it. And then the second finger is our patriarch, somebody older, wiser, been there, done that. And the third finger is our ring finger, and that's our partners, our parents as young people. Later on, my spouse is my partner. But if I partner, too many of young people see their parents as the enemy instead of as the partner. And what you're always, you don't really, you always oppose everything I do. Well, they're there to do that, to help you to get a grip on life. And if they would see it that way, that would help them to get a grip on life as parents. And then the little finger represents the peers. And our peers are good. You know, I want young people to look to the young people, hopefully godly, wise young people that they can learn from because they're experiencing life with you. I'm not, a, it's a long time since, since I was a teenager. It's a long time since I was 15, 16 years old. And, 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 and back then it was a different world than it is today. And so it's good to have a godly peer that you can say, hey, how do you handle this? How do you deal with this? To talk to you about, to talk with about that. But, you know, we don't pick up things like this. Your little finger is a stabilizing finger. It's not the main. Don't listen to your peers because your peers are just as stupid as you are. They've got no more life experience. They've got no more you know, education you do, listen to the ones that are there, especially your parents, 
they're there to help you to get a grip on life and to understand that. Okay, and then the letter C there, we must teach our children to value what God has given them. Um, going back to Ephesians chapter six, is if we can teach our children to value us as parents, then they learn to value the other things that God gives them in life. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter four and verse number four. 1 Thessalonians four and verse four. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. I want to teach my young people to understand that by honoring their parents, they're honoring God and they're honoring themselves. They're valuing themselves. They're valuing what God has given them in their lives. And so it's one of the things that we as parents want our children to learn. And so, you know, these are great verses for the kids and, and they need to learn. And I hope you young people here will, will think about this and I hope you've listened and heard and are understanding a little bit better what your relationship with your parents should be. But at the same time, we as parents can say, okay, do I create a dialogue with my kids? Do I make sure that they're, I'm not just talking at them, I'm talking with them? Have I taught them to, how to obey so that they can learn how to listen and, and, to, and, and honor? And am I somebody that is honorable? So my kids, honor me as a parent, the way I act, the way I live. And uh, I'm not sure that was always true for me as a dad. And, and, and so when the kids, when we don't live that honorable life, we're not helping them to honor us either. Ultimately, they, have, they should honor whether we're good or bad, but we got to help them to do that. Okay, and um, look at Colossians 3.29. I'm sorry, 320, thank you. Colossians 3.20. Um, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. So again, next time a young person, you're, you're struggling with obeying your parents and listening to them and honoring them, understand it's not just about them. It, it's about God. You know, Hebrews 13, 17, that they may do it with joy. Your ultimate responsibility, whether it's a husband and wife or whether it's parent, children and parents or whether it's a boss and employee, your ultimate responsibility to your authority is to obey and submit in such a way that they're happy with you. And a lot of times we're not. You know, a lot of times I look at my kids, do I look happy right now? You know, and, and, and again, like I mentioned the other week, if, if dad, if, you know, we have a little slogan we had in the house that was if mom ain't happy and ain't nobody happy, is, is the whole idea is that it's not just she's grump, but if you don't make mom happy, then, I, then I'm not gonna be happy. And if I'm not happy, I'm gonna make sure you're not happy. And so it goes all the way around. And ultimately we wanna please the one that's most important, that's the Lord. And when I say to my parents, yes, ma'am. Or sometimes when I say, okay, I hear what you're telling me to do, but I, I don't understand why I have to do it. Why can't I do this instead? And in a respectful Daniel type manner, talk about it and present alternatives, then your kids are gonna be happy with you. And your parents are going to be happy with the kids. And it creates that right balance in that way. Okay, any other thoughts on verses one through three? Answer? I think it's interesting that um, this part of the letter Paul is now talking to, and he is addressing the family, but now he's talking about the, the talking to the children now. Uh, but it just brings me back to chapter five, where in the beginning it says, it, he's talking to the whole church, and he's saying, uh, be each, uh, be therefore followers of God as dear children, um, and he's, he's already addressed the adults, um, and, he, and then he goes on to say, um, be, uh, be the children of God, not as the children of disobedience, um, and he's talking about how we should be living in light of like the public and how we act as Christians, but then now he's, he's finally addressing the, okay, good. the children. Yeah, and, and answers point out, verse number, chapter five, verse one, be there for followers of God as dear children. Again, we can take these principles and apply them to our relationship. And, and remember, Jesus took a child and said, you need to be like this little child. And the and, and Bible talks about in Corinthians, be children in understanding and malice, be, or be men in understanding and malice, be children. I forget how the verse is the exact word, but he's using children as an example. And so he's saying we're to be like children. So he's not addressing just the kids. We can all learn from this in our relationship one with another and especially our relationship with whatever authority we have in our life. 
And these same principles apply to the husband-wife relationship. They apply to the boss-employee relationship. They apply to spiritual relationships, whatever they might be. They still apply in that same way. Okay? Any other comments before we move on? Noel? Okay, let me stop and share that with online. She's saying from both Exodus and Deuteronomy, it says that talking about the same idea of obeying your parents and honoring them, then and it'll be well with thee in the land which God hath given thee. Okay, mm-hmm. go on. fighting in. Okay. Yeah. Cause we're not accepting what God has for us and he has a lot to give us in that way. Okay. Um, then, and, and, and we as parents like our kids to memorize verses one through three, but we don't memorize verse four and we need to put that in context and you fathers provoke not your children wrath, but bring them up in the nursery of the Lord. So we're going to talk about next week, what it means to provoke your children. That's what I want you to really think about. What does it mean to provoke your children to wrath? What does it mean? And then go over to Colossians chapter 3 and look at verse number 21. Colossians 3, 21. It says, Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Okay? So in Ephesians, it's telling, provoke them not to wrath. Uh, and then it talks about anger, and it talks about be discouraged. So how does that discourage them? Uh, so think about that. What does the word provoke mean? And then how does it end up discouraging your children when you provoke them to wrath or to anger. And so we'll look at that more and then talk about how we can provoke them in the right way and, and, um, and going from there. Okay. So we'll stop there and we'll continue on next week and, uh, going through this, some good, um, good principles there to look at with that. All right. Thank you for being with us tonight and we'll see you on Sunday.